Hey, this is C. Peter Cimarroni. I'm the CEO and chairman at both Razor Limited, uh, the protocol, as well as creator and host of Blood Time, the podcast. Catch me on Jesse T's show coming up this week. Peter Cimarroni, what's going on, brother? Jesse T, my brother. What's happening, man? Everything, man. Everything. Man. everything. I'm we were, representing, bro. I'm I representing. I Grin see False it, Tigers. Go Tigers. <laughs> Go Tigers. We were we were just chatting before we jumped on about a big event this weekend with uh, Jordan Burrows and uh, Frank. Uh, how do you say the last name? Jermizo. Jermizo. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We were just uh, obviously you're big into wrestling. We'll dive into that, man. But uh, what were your thoughts on the match? Well, you know, uh, there again, we were talking about it, and and they are so tight uh, talent wise. This this is a creme de la creme, if you will. Uh, Tremizo is an alien with his hips. Jordan is the blast double master. Uh, and it was just, you know, the high offense versus the high defense meeting each other. And the last time Jordan got him, this time Tremizo got him. So, and it, it's tight, three to two. I mean, you don't get tighter than that, right? So. Who's up uh, on the lead? Is it is it Jordan? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. I, it, like I was telling you, I think if, if they wrestle 10 times, I think Jordan's winning six. Tremizo's winning four. Yeah. Uh, they're that close. But Jordan, I believe, ultimately is the better talent. I agree. I actually had the chance to meet him a couple of years ago. I was at a, uh, it's called the Berkshire Hathaway meeting out in Omaha. My mentor, uh, he, uh, the he Oracle of, of uh, Omaha. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. He gets a bunch of people together. And, uh, one of the speakers that came in to speak that night was Jordan Barrow. So I got to hang out with him, take some pictures with them. And he's just highly intellectual, very charismatic, uh, very down to earth. And it's, it's, it's insane because on the other side of that face, there's a, there's a killer. <laughs> Yes. And, you know, I love our sport. It's so honest and it keeps you so grounded uh, because it, you, no matter how bad of an ass you are, so there's somebody better. Always. <laughs> yeah. Always. It's yeah. the it's a lot of the jungle because even if you are the baddest of the bad, eventually you age out, you know? Yes, indeed. Right. Well said. And I just interviewed on my 50th podcast episode, Kyvin Gatson, who pinned Kyle Schneider as a freshman. And Kyle is our youngest Olympic champion at that weight and three-time NCAA champion as well as two-time world champion. So, hey, it happens. Uh, and Gatson is, you know, and Gatson now is number two behind uh, Kyle Schneider at that weight. So it's amazing. Amazing. Uh, since we're on the topic of wrestling, man, and I know this is in your heart, soul, and your DNA, talk a little bit about your journey with it, how you started and what you're doing with it today. Yeah, I was a fat little kid in seventh grade. Uh, I was uh, 4'11", 165 pounds with a 41-inch waist. And my dad's and my uncle was uh, the first uh, – state place winner in the history of Cleveland Heights High School. And he and my dad uh, had a sit down with me, said, dude, you got to do something. And so I, I love football. I could play football as a fatty, but uh, I didn't want to do that. I had a baby brother coming. He came at, I was 13 years older than him. And I said, I don't want his, his older brother to be a, you know, a, a pudge, if you will. My, my nickname was Pugsley, Jesse. Oh, wow. Uh, Pugsley is the, uh, the fat kid on the Adams family. Yes. <laughs> so, I went to my doctor. He put me on this uh, really cool uh, way of eating. It wasn't a diet. And I lost 30 pounds. And by the time I was a sophomore in high school, uh, through wrestling uh, and through uh, the, the tutelage of Coach I Marino, who's a Hall of Famer, Coach I, uh, I was at uh, 5'7", 126 pounds with a 28-inch waist. <clears throat> and to wow. this day, I'm, I'm 61 years old, or 60, I'm sorry, 63 years old. And uh, my waist is a 29 I weighed in today at 131 pounds. So lean and mean, brother. Lean and mean, baby. Let's go. Let's go, man. I'm like a piece of gristle. <laughs> I'm grizzly. What was the protocol? I'm grizzly, the, 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 the nutrition. The nutrition plan. You know, it's a it's a, a one ingredient food diet. I eat very whole foods. Anything more than one ingredient, I shy away from. So I'm eating, you know, a piece of broccoli, a piece of fish, uh, you know, uh, a, 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 an orange. Uh, a banana, uh, uh, you know, a carrot. I don't like to buy complex foods. I want body, my body to recognize it as fuel burns efficiently. So my BMR is high. You know, my BMI, I'm a, I'm a 20 BMI, you know, so uh, <clears throat> I'm really, I'm really a believer in that. And then a lot of hydration, great sleep, uh, stretching exercises, a lot of walking and some weightlifting. And I still ref, wrestle a, t a tidbit. <laughs> so. Listen, those are the core <clears throat> tenets of, of uh, health and wellness, brother. I'm, I'm really big into what they call nowadays biohacking, which is just sure. optimizing your body, your mind, your soul, everything. And, and, and I'm big into this guy named Paul Check. Have you heard that name before? 
I have not. No. Uh-huh. Paul Check is this. Uh, he's like one of the founders, <laughs> one of the thought leaders of, of of biohacking, and he talks about the four doctors. And one of the the main doctors, Doctor Rest slash Doctor Sleep. And you yep. talk about rest. That's that's pretty much the most important thing you can do because there's a lot of younger people that will go out and burn the midnight oil. And they'll go train really hard, but because they didn't get the proper rest, they're literally killing themselves. They're, yeah. they're, they're not getting their mind to be healed because there's all these cognitive degenerative issues, especially in the sports that you play, talking about football and wrestling, where if you're not getting even just enough rest, you're really killing yourself. And so where did, where did you get the, the idea of nutrition? Was it, was it all around sports? Was there a thought leader in your life that said, hey, listen, this is how you live life well? Where did that get implanted in your brain? You know, it, was, it came from Dr. Charles York, who was my pediatrician in 1970 wow. and my mother was a nutrition major at Ohio State so she was big believer in whole foods and she was a big believer in what not was not organic but you know our backyard garden yep and so well if we couldn't get it from our backyard garden we got from neighbors gardens I mean you know I, my mother is an Armenian my father is an Italian they like their gardens <laughs> <laughs> I get it <laughs> you know so now, granted, it, you know, it was the 60s and 70s, so a lot of processed stuff was in vogue, you know, TV dinners and yes. all that nonsense and convenient food coming out of the, the 40s and 50s, particularly the, the war mentality of, you know, canteen rations and all that. Yep. But my mother was a real believer in that. And so she was my my first guru. And then I took it to the next level, understanding our sport and recognizing that what you put in your body is so doggone important and how you treat the out of outer of your body is even as important. So it's that internal external mix. And then we talk about those four foundational pillars of doing the right thing physically, mentally, emotionally, and psychologically, spiritually. So that's really what, you know, we really believe in. It's a holistic approach. It's all about what you're consuming. And you, like, I love what you said. It's not just the nutrition and, and the rest, which are you know, huge. It's, it's also the people you're hanging out with, the conversations you're having, the, sure. the things that you're, you're you know, planting in your mind. That, that all bleeds out into a life well lived, man. And it's, it's great to hear other people that, that, that feel that and believe that. And so talking about those, uh, you know, those, mm-hmm. the, that's kind of part of your ethos, it sounds like. Just hard work, discipline, um, yeah. you know, showing up for yourself so that you can show up better for the world. How is that playing into your business today in terms of what you do today? How, how can you see that that's playing out for the better? Well, we are a best practices company, Jesse. We search out, vet, and engage the best of the best practices. And I, if I'm engaged in a client, I go in and triage them. I find out what's right, what's wrong with them, where they want to be, and why. It's the why. Because if they just want to be mediocre, I'm the wrong cat for them. If they want to go from good to great, rock on. Let's go. Now, but I also want to know what they want to do. So do they want to grow? Do they want to acquire and grow? Do they want to have efficiencies on their line items? Or do they want to be acquired? Do they want to build their valuation to the point that they can get their best multiple? So all of those come into the mix, if you will. And then we put together and we marry that that thought process, that vision, and then we we engage the strategic plan. And my company quarterbacks that, and I I tend to be more, you know, uh, mostly that quarterback. You know, I think it's important for people to understand. Uh, I, I think you're a total badass in some of the entrepreneurial <laughs> endeavors and some of the sales uh, acumen that you've, you've gained through the years. Talk a little bit about some of the highlights in terms of entrepreneurial experience and uh, overview of the career. Well, you know, thanks, Jesse. Yeah, we were blessed back in 1998. Uh, my brother-in-law and I and my sister came up with an idea called Cough Pops, cough drop on a stick. And it was a, it was just a very natural, nonchalant situation. I'm sitting at my sister and brother-in-law's house. He was a, he was a doctor. We lost him about two years ago. And he's Sorry to hear that, brother. Missed, deeply missed, uh, Dr. Jim Guerreri. But anyhow, having said that, <clears throat> he is holding a lozenge in his three-year-old's mouth. And I said, what the hell are you doing? She goes, he goes, well, <laughs> she's got a little sore throat. I don't want to give her any medicine. We're, you know, it's a little, you know, whatever. It was a cold ease or a loon. I don't know what it was. I just don't want her to aspirate. I said, well, there's got to be a better way than that, holding it in her mouth. He goes, yeah, why don't we put it on a stick? Bingo. And then two years later, we were in the marketplace. Wow. Yeah. Talk about that, 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 because that's, 
there's a lot more that went into that two years, right? That's not, you know, you just oh. <laughs> oh. <laughs> talk about going to market, ideation, processes, sales, yeah. talk about the whole the getting dirty, man. Yeah. It, if somebody would have told me then what I had to go through for two years, I said, pass. Yeah. Because <laughs> the blood, sweat, and tears, bro. I'm talking to, you know, and wow. But what I ended up, what we ended up doing, Jesse, was creating a nutraceutical as opposed to a pharmaceutical. So we got the nutraceutical based on chelated zinc and ascorbic acid. So really what it did was it just took away the sore throat and shortened the duration of the, of the virus that you had through the, through, through the zinc, which is a, is a tried and true situation, even with Corona. People are taking zinc to, uh, you know, to lessen the severity and lessen the time. Zinc, frame. magnesium, vitamin D, all those things. Vitamin support. D, yeah, yeah, D, K, all that. It's beautiful. So having said that, I decided to, to go to the marketplace and to see what this was all about. And we, there was no such thing as a cough pop. It was a cough drop. It was a lollipop. So we had to create the SKU, the actual SKU. Yep. And it was, you know, so it, it was it was daunting. So I wanted to get the best people. So I got the best distributor, the best manufacturer, the best packager, and the best branding company I could, I could, I could find. I quarterbacked that as a virtual company. So we created an umbrella company called Coughco, and then we employed these vendor partners underneath us. And it was, an, it was a relatively easy transition once that was done, but it was painstaking to go through for a year and a half. Yep. And then on top of that, I went to family and friends and raised almost $2 million. Brother, and how'd brother you do in, that? <laughs> in North, well, I did it on a lot of golf dates and a lot, a lot, a lot, of, a lot of late nights. But I, I'll tell you that in Northeast Ohio in the 90s, we were not a consumer product in the, uh, uh, area. There was only three consumer products in the entire decade that came out of Northeast Ohio. It was Gojo, Purell, yep. the Spin Toothbrush, and us. So we were in high, we were in high company. Uh, we did nothing close to those two companies, <laughs> but we still, we still had a seven figure year, a uh, few years. And we did a nice, you know, I would say it was a triple compared to their grand slams. You know, so, it, it's funny. Last time we talked when we first met over zoom and just connecting, uh, you were talking about, you were, you felt like you were pushing a ton of products, so to speak, but then there was some conversation or something that came through about Hershey, Hershey. And like, there was yeah, the, talk, yeah. talk about that. Yeah, that was, that was cathartic for me and very, very eye-opening. So I am summoned by Joe Viviano in 1999 to his office after we had met with Coldies. Uh, Coldies was also a Pennsylvania company. So uh, he, he says, I want to talk to you about maybe, who knows, maybe purchasing you guys. So I go up there with my partner, and my partner was the guy who wrote the check for $2 million. So he had a private jet. So we, we flew up there in his private jet. And uh, I'm, a, I'm at that point, I think I'm in my early 40s. So I'm not a kid, but I'm also not somebody that's ever met with Joe Viviano type individuals. <clears throat> so I, I go in there, you know, I just, hey, man, I am who I am. I walk in there. He's sitting in Milton Hershey's office. <laughs> Above him is a like 15 foot portrait of Milton Hershey. Okay. Daunting. <laughs> and, and he's sitting, yeah, he's sitting in this high back chair, you know, right out of trading places, you know. <laughs> So I sit there and I go, all right, what's up? So Viviano, he's, he's an Italian guy and he liked my Italian, you know, surname. So we're vibing and he goes, okay, man, how many, uh, how many, how many cough pops have you sold? I said, 8 million units. He goes, we, we do 32 million kisses a day. He says, come back when you're doing 8 million bucks and we'll talk. I said, Hey baby, God bless you. And now that doesn't even include Reese's, you know, uh, cups and almond joy and Kit Kats and all. Can you imagine the amount of chocolate? And literally, when you drive into Hershey, it smells like you're being bathed in chocolate. It's crazy. I can't even imagine it. I'm, I'm starting to wrap my mind around all the chocolate that would be. That's 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 like tons and tons and tons and tons. Can like just warehouses full of just chocolate. Where where do they get it all? Where, where? Well, it's sugar. It's sugar and cocoa and milk, and that's where really what the, the, the mind boggling thing is. I mean, they have these huge vats of milk and huge vats of, you know, uh, sugar. And huge, I mean, it's just insane, you know. And so the 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 fascinating and amazingly talented human beings that are running that company 
are stunning. And, and they bought out every, every, almost every candy maker. It's either M&M, Mars, or yep. Hershey today, you know, or Nestle, Nestle too, Nestle. So, but uh, it was an eye opener, my friend. And uh, I recognized how insignificant <laughs> we could all be, but also, hey, I was significant that day to him. So, well, and, and you think about it. I mean, you're pushing cough pops and, and you, you're doing over seven figures in revenue. I mean, that's, that's impressive. I mean, even just, you know, a local entrepreneur that's doing a million dollars a year, just like as a small, like one or two person company, maybe you have some uh, 1099s or some, some vendors that you outsource to, but that's a great business. And just because you're in the room with a giant, you're a giant as well. So I, I definitely applaud wow. you for building that business so, so, so high. So now talking about kind of more of what you're focused on today in your business and your life, what are some of the things that you're working on today? Well, you know, the, uh, the, the triage and the best practices has really been fantastic for us. And being able to get into the C-suite has always been a talent of mine. So we're putting together a program to help others get into the C-suite at a very, uh, very modest cost. And it's a real, it's a step-by-step -step, um, implementation, if you will, and process. And so we think we've got a smart way of doing that and really helping a lot of people because it's really difficult to get in the C-suite. And uh, particularly today, because there's so much noise and so many outreaches that are just not effective. And it's daunting. And it's also disillusioning for a lot of sales executives to constantly be rejected, constantly be rejected, even though they have a phenomenal product to be brought in, brought to the marketplace. And then also, call, of course, my podcast, which has just been an absolute joy to do to bring these remarkable individuals and their transformative stories to the marketplace and now do it on a little bit bigger platform because the Evergreen Podcasting Network is just, we've just signed a deal with them. So we'll be uh, in, incorporated into their, their entire network in April. It's so exciting. It's just so exciting. Beautiful, brother. Yeah, I've been in sales pretty much my whole, my whole, my whole life. And, uh, you know, getting into professional sales, uh, you know, in a career, um, it was definitely a skill to be able to get in front of the decision maker, the C-suite, specifically the C-suite, because if it's a, if it's an entrepreneurial based company, like let's say it's your company and you got a, a brick and mortar and you're, you're, you're probably in the building as the owner and you're, you're probably either somewhere walking around the building and, or like a door away. And as a salesperson, we used to be able to go, we used to do direct sales when I first started my sales career, my pro professional sales career. Cause I had a not so professional sales career in Boston for a while. Uh, okay. But, okay. But as, far, as far as uh, getting into the professional sales, my first job was outside sales, door to door, cold call commission, business to business. It was yeah. it was the Navy SEALs boot camp of sale, uh, sales training. It was the perfect thing. To, it brought me to where I am today. I'll say that. But we awesome. used to just walk into a business cold call, knock on the door, go in or just open the door, walk into the business and introduce ourselves. And a lot of times the owner, the, the, the decision maker could hear us speaking because they were just an office away. And so that was easier, I feel like, to be able to get in front of them because they were around. But a lot of times when you're dealing with corporate, so most times you can't just walk into these high rises without you know, an appointment, you, like if, if this is where they are. And so getting in, in front of a decision maker and getting past the gatekeeper is a much different strategy. So talk a little bit about kind of uh, the secret sauce without giving the farm away of, of, of how you've been able to figure that out so that you can give that to other people. You know, it's just by handwritten notes of thanks and congratulations, and then a cra highly crafted um, letter that is respectful, intelligent, compelling with a call to action. And that they know that if they, if we go in there, we're going to pro provide a solution that they need. So we've done our homework, but more, more than ever today, if you write a handwritten note of just really genuineness of, Hey, congratulations on your acquisition or congratulations on your growth or congratulations on your new CFO or whatever that is, or I heard your dad died, you know, my condolences, or I heard, I heard, you know, one of your top executives is ill or whatever that is. Okay. Those are the ways to set up the foundation. And then you become a confidant and that's where you want to live. Not a rep, not an exec, a confidant. So I love it. Yeah, they come to you for more than just business. It's it's the idea. Well, number one, it's you're being personable and you're being a good human being, especially if it's something that pulls on the heartstrings and you're generally saying, "Hey, I'm sorry for your loss," or you know, uh, "Let us know how we can support you," whatever that is. Yep. But 
Uh, you're also going against the current market, like what you talked about. Like everybody's focused on email sequences and everybody's focused on all these marketing things are starting to get so overused, but you're going back to kind of the roots of what used to be the way to do business. Um, and yeah. so you're kind of, you know, you're, you're re kind of circumventing the sales process and it's, it's just a uni- unique kind of value proposition. And here's the idea behind it. The psychology is, is uh, there's a book that I read a while back called Giftology and yeah. Giftology <laughs> speaks to getting gifts for people. Uh, a lot of times, the first time you meet them, it's kind of like Kings used to do back in the day. If you go to yeah. a new you know, kingdom, you bring them an offering, say, Hey, great to meet you. Let's you know, be friends. So there's that side of it where it creates reciprocity, but then there's also getting them something that matters to them. So like not just, you know, a piggy bank with Tedisco financial on it, but getting them something with thought and care that actually matters to them. Like if they have a family member and, you know, you, they want to, you know, do something nice for them or something with their name on it, not your name yeah. on it. It sounds like you kind of have the psychology play in there. No, no question about that. And also, too, you stand out because nobody's getting letters or handwritten notes anymore. And you hand address it and you hand stamp it or you hand deliver it. Yes. I mean, it's just, you know, it just so, so stands out. And I can't tell you how many times I'll get a call or a, or a note back saying you made my day because I never get I never get this anymore. You know, everybody's emailing or, or texting or DMing or, you know, or, or even phone calls. So we stand out that way. And then the other thing, what you were saying too, Jesse, one of the the greatest relationships I have to this day, it, it happened about, um, well, gosh, let's see, um, almost 30 years ago, about 28 years ago, I was at a, a dinner with a potential client who we were beginning to really vibe. And uh, we were there with our with our spouses. And I was wearing a watch that wasn't that expensive, maybe a couple hundred bucks, but it was cool. It was really cool. It was like a throwback watch, you know, and it looked like something right out of World War II, like maybe a Brit would wear, you know? Yeah. And the dude said, man, I love that watch. I took it off and gave it to him. He goes, no, I, can't. I said, no, that's yours. Yours. And from that day on, we've done business. Unbelievable. You know, I was just, I don't know. It just hit me. I said, dude, you got to have this watch. It looked better on you than on me, you know. It just, it was just something like. <laughs> and you felt called to do something nice. You know what's really crazy? <clears throat> being called to do something nice, or I've noticed a couple times in my life where I gen- genuinely paid someone a compliment, not looking for anything in return. And well, case in point, it's kind of a smaller thing, but I looked at someone. I was working in a bank a long time ago, and yeah. one of the coworkers there, I was like, "That's a beautiful umbrella," and she's like, "Do you want it?" And I'm like, "Really?" And she's like, "I was like, yeah." So very similar to your story. And even this weekend, I had my boys uh, and we were going through a drive through and we were getting some food. And uh, again, not not in line with nutrition, but sometimes you got to do what you got to do. So yeah, <laughs> I get it, bro. I had, yeah, dude, I get it. I and, and, and so it was it was chicken, though. So at least it was it was. <laughs> so, <laughs> right. And so anyway, uh, I, I look in the car in front of me as she's pulling away, about to pull away from her, her order. And I, and she's a little bit older. And I, I see her looking in, in her uh, rearview mirror and I just smiled. I innately just smiled at her. And she smiled and we didn't think, I didn't think anything else of it. And I look back, keep playing with my boys. As soon as I pull up to the window, Peter, the lady's like, your order's taken care of. I'm Love like, it. I'm Love like, it. what do you mean? And she's like, the lady who just left paid for it. I'm like, oh my goodness. It's like karma. And then I look behind me, but there was no one behind me because I was going to pay it back that way too. But yeah, yeah, I it's get beautiful it. how that, it, it, just one beautiful act of kindness can literally change the world. <laughs> I get it. I get it. I, 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 I get it, man. I remember... I'll leave you with this story. I know that you got to probably jump quickly, right? So, but I coached, you know, obviously all these years and I had a really uh, sweet statistician and she also became a babysitter for us. And I saw her oh, probably about uh, seven, eight years later. And she was in line and new mother and very frazzled and she forgot her, she forgot her money. And she had, her, she had a baby and she had diapers. And I said, I walked right up and I said, I, I cut through the lines and I got to take care of this lady. And the ladies, it was like at a TJ Maxx or something. I don't know what it was, you know. So they let me cut up and I just you know, I paid for her and put my arm around her. And she just, you know, she just gave me the biggest hug. Hey, right? It's just, oh my God. I just remember this to this day and I was probably 25 years ago. It's so, beautiful, brother. It's the, it's the feeling that you created for yourself and someone else. And um, before we jump, I do want to ask one more question about your sure. podcast. And because it looks like I have a few more minutes, maybe five more minutes. So, as far okay. as uh, your podcast, where did you come up with the idea? What's the podcast about? And what are some of the things you're talking about on the podcast? You know, it's uh, after 40 years of, of, of coaching, meeting all these these remarkable young men that I've had the honor to coach, and then also talking to other coaches 
um, about the same kind of thing that we, it really matters because we need to be that rudder, that rudder as a coach, keeping them on track to that point of light, right? Yes. Hopefully the light is, you know, the true light, not a train coming at you, but anyhow, <laughs> right. you know what I mean? So, so we, we just saw, and then these guys would come back, ask me to be in, in you know, on their, in their business, start organizations like wrestlers in business, be on their boards, consult with them, or just talk to them, you know? Uh, and so I, I wrote a book called Benevolent Capitalism. And in that book, there's a chapter called The Teacher Becomes the Student, and the student becomes the teacher. Yep. And so what, what happened was these kids started to teach me about their, the lessons that we taught them in that room and how they took it to the real world and evolved it and transformed it and became innovators and disruptors and, and creative thought leaders, right? So they came back to me and I said, you know, I gotta get this in the, in, into, the, into the marketplace besides a book. I need to get it into video, to audio, blah, blah, blah. And so I went to uh, my best friend who was also a kid I coached, who was also my assistant coach, who's still my dearest best friend, and his son who was doing a podcast. I said, I need you to produce. He goes, I'm in coach. And so this is, he's like a, He's like a, a nephew to me, if you will. I, you know, yeah. Uncle Coach or Uncle Peter. And so we've been doing that since early 19 or late 19, uh, 2019. And blood time means in our sport, if you get blood, you get time to get you know cleaned up and blah, blah, blah. Blood time in our podcast means the bond, the moment, the aha moment between the athlete and the coach when they're both transformed. And in that transformation, what does the athlete do in the real world? Because not what you know not what about what 0.1 percent of athletes get paid for what they do 99.9 percent .9 of them it's about what they do in the real world yes the lessons learned in those rooms on those courts on those fields you know whatever endeavor that you're in sport wise it's what you do with them i love it brother i think i think you're 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 a powerful shining light and you're not the train light coming at you but you're a, you're, you're a lighthouse and you're, and you're, you. you're guiding people to shore and giving people direction and, and, and hope, honestly. And, and I talk about this a lot because I do what started out as men's work, but now has become it's, it's co-ed men and women where, um, you know, we're, we're kind of in dark times in the world, in a sense, with, with, with pandemic, with politics, with uh, some of the things that are coming down the road, but potentially the great reset and, and the powers that be there. But um, there are a lot of people like yourself, like myself, that are coming to the fruition, like the forefront to shine a light in whatever capacity it is. And so whether it's you being a coach and a mentor and a leader, but then also what I heard too was beautiful was how your, your kids and students are teaching you and, and they become the teacher. So like there's this beautiful wheel and transfer of light and knowledge. that's beautiful. And, you know, um, I looked at this a few months ago and I, I looked at both of my sons, they're six and a half and four and a half. And I just, I'm always in awe of them. And I, I love being a dad. And I just looked at them and I was like, they're my teachers. They're the best teachers I could ever have because they'll teach you about frustration and patience and attitude and things that you may lose because you're like pissed at what they're doing. <laughs> so it's like, it's, you got to have that, that love and that empathy for them. And it's just this beautiful cycle, man. So I love what you're doing. Love what you're about. And next time when we have more time, I'd love to have you back on the show, but thank you so much for being you. He's the amazing, the mighty, the powerful Peter Cimarroni. I'm Jesse T. Be sure to catch us on next week's episode of the Jesse T Show.